Thank you so much. It's really a, a pleasure to be here uh, and a really great opportunity for me to um, review some content that we've been thinking about at the University of Virginia that I've had real honor of sinking some of my teeth into, but together with lots of other folks. Uh, and then to begin to raise some of these questions institutionally uh, in a very, very different context. Uh, I landed last night uh, at Santa Barbara Airport and have never landed in an airport that looks quite like that. And so you all have something going on here. It's kind of, kind of amazing. <laughs> really, really something else. Um, let me actually begin my talk with just a brief moment of silence uh, to recognize the fact that my home institution, the University of Virginia, stands on the ancestral lands of the Monacan people. Thank you. So the University of Virginia is an incredibly beautiful place. We use our built environment to attract students uh, with ease. It was identified in the late 1970s as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which suggests that it's actually not just important on a state stage or a national stage, but the history of the world. It contributes in some way to the history of the world. Why? Well, of course, because the University of Virginia is a materialization of the extraordinarily long shadow of one man, Thomas Jefferson. And when I talk with students about architecture at the University of Virginia, um, we obviously have to talk about Jefferson, uh, the architect of the university, and in many ways, the architect of democracy. And I remind my students that the University of Virginia was a project that Jefferson began at the age of 74. Which is a sobering thought. Why, at the age of 74, would Thomas Jefferson inaugurate a huge project for a brand new university? And the answer actually lies in the fact that it's a completion project of, an, of a whole arc, a life committed to constructing democracy. What does that mean? We often think of Jefferson, of course, and rightly, as the author of the Declaration of Independence. We absolutely should do that. We also know that Jefferson, as he always did, had his fingers in Madison's mind via uh, conversations when Madison was trying to author the Constitution. And what is the fundamental, uh, one, of the, one of the fundamental um, contributions of the Constitution? But the establishment of our structures of government and embedded in those structures of government are checks and balances. And in the midst of that conversation with Madison, Jefferson wrote, the best defense against a corrupt government is what? Education. An educated populace. The best defense against a corrupt government is an educated populace. And so in this way, when he inaugurates the project of the University of Virginia, Jefferson is actually completing the final chapter of a life committed to building out the architecture of democracy. It's an extraordinary story. And the simple fact that he dies, we all know that he, well, we all know, those of us at the University of Virginia know, that he, of course, dies on the same day as, as Adams, right? They think of each other and they're dying in this sort of a, uh, and, and what is that day? Anybody know? July 5th. Right, I mean, like, really? You die on the 50th anniversary of the 4th of July. I mean, you know, the man is amazing. Um, uh, he also, uh, he also sort of, you know, then makes this kind of commitment to democracy. And so um, Jefferson is thinking about the University of Virginia as he's designing it in its architecture, as he's designing it in its curriculum, and it's a radically progressive curriculum for its age, which we'll talk very briefly about, um, and its built environment. All of this is part and parcel of a project of democracy. And that's our place of beginning. Now, when I talk about, how many of you have been to the University of Virginia? OK. Oh, actually, more than, OK, that's great. So when I say the University of Virginia and I say architecture of the University of Virginia, your immediate response is going to be a singular building. Like, what's that most important building? The rotunda, right? That round building at the end, this guy right here, right? The big round building, which is a library. So many, most of my students are actually surprised when I tell them that actually the library, that rotunda is an afterthought. Jefferson adds the rotunda later. The first designs for the University of Virginia didn't include a rotunda at all, because for Jefferson, the critical architecture of the University of Virginia lives in the pavilions. 
Now, the pavilions are these buildings. I've got photographs of a few of them. There's five pavilions on either side of an open lawn. The pavilions are the residences for the faculty, right? Their apartments upstairs, I mean, not today, of course, deans and provosts and important people live in them now, sadly. Um, but when Jefferson imagined them, not me, unfortunately, but um, when Jefferson imagined them, they were tended to be the residences for the faculty. So apartments upstairs and classrooms downstairs, OK? Uh, 10, five on each side, 10 pavilions. Why? Well, in part, because Jefferson actually subdivided all what he referred to as useful knowledge, right? How many of you have degrees in religious studies? Yeah, not useful. Thank you very much. We're just going to dismiss that, right? All, all useful knowledge, right, is incorporated into the curriculum at the University of Virginia. And he divides all useful knowledge into 10 domains. Those 10 domains will live in the intellect of a professor. That brain lives in a body, and the body lives in a pavilion. Right? And so there's a direct correlation then between the subdivision of all useful knowledge and the architecture of the university. Right? Reinforcing then its commitment to graduating students prepared to lead a new democracy. It's a sweet little circle. Right? It all comes together. And that story that I've just unfolded for you is one that the University of Virginia has been telling for a very long time. And in part because it's so compelling. This particular narrative centered on a singular person and his contributions to the flourishing of Western democracy, not an insignificant story, is one that has been so captivating that we have allowed ourselves and allowed our gaze to be distracted from alternative histories. We have such a powerful history that we've allowed ourselves to continue to focus on that singular history. The University of Virginia was a landscape of slavery for its first half century. Its first half century, it was both built by and then operated by large numbers of enslaved people. They were living in and around this place. And the University of Virginia has never, until recently, told that story. That was not part of our institutional narrative. So that means that as we are moving into a period, particularly after the summer of 2017, but a project that actually has legs a decade before that, as we're moving into an era where we're actually doing the work of truth-telling, public institutions should be institutions committed to truth-telling. And as we're doing the work of truth-telling, we're having to learn how to unsee. Because that story, the monumentality of that architecture is so articulate and so profound, it's hard not to see Jefferson when we see the, the built environment of the academical village. So we've had to learn how to unsee. That means finding in new and different ways of reframing the conversation and using different images. So what's before you is a plat. This is a plat of the University of Virginia drawn in 1850. And I want to highlight just a few key components so that you can see right here. Do I have a pointer? Is there a pointer on this thing? No? Okay. Oh, that's a, yeah, if you don't want that. <laughs> I've given away my story. OK, so the, um, this long, narrow rectangle here in the middle is the lawn, five pavilions on either side, and then the round rotunda at the far end, right? Ah, oh, fabulous. Thank you. Um, so there's the rotunda, that's the lawn. This is the University of Virginia as it's historically understood. But in fact, what you'll notice is that in 1850, as it's drawn out, there's a whole lot of empty space around the University of Virginia, right? We don't have um, physics labs uh, and old dorms and new dorms. Like, none of that exists, right, in 1850. So what is there? Well, we're going to zero in, and I'm going to ask you this particular question. Here we are. This is just a detail. There's the Academical Village. And I want to ask you all to read this text for me. What do these words say? The 10 professors, grass, lots, containing, and I cropped it too small, I'm sorry, uh, four and a half acres. The 10 professors, grass, lots, containing four and a half acres. And down here, again, 
gardens, one acre each. Now let me ask you a question. Why is it in the 1850s would a professor need a four and a half acre grass lot and a one acre garden? Because they were underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some things remain unchanged. <laughs> Solidarity. Um, no. <laughs> What do you need a four acre grass lot? What is a four acre grass lot in 1850 in Virginia? It's a pasture for livestock, right? And a one acre garden is what? It's a kitchen garden, right? By the way, those professors have not just brains, but they have mouths and stomachs. And somehow they're gonna need to eat. So there's a whole landscape of operation here that is immediately apparent as soon as you start looking. It's not very difficult to see, but you have to want to see it. You have to have the heart to want to see the landscape and the story that is an institution you don't want to. Oh. Would you notice the privy down to the right? It's kind of a long walk to that. Uh, that would be the field privy, actually. The, the, faculty, the faculty have their own privies, of course. OK, so now we're going to dive into it, and I'm just going to do a little sub-story. This is Pavilion 4. Pavilion 4 has long been understood to be the residence of George Bladerman. George Bladerman, all of UVA's first faculty are Europeans. Jefferson does not trust those faculty coming from my alma mater, the College of William and Mary, which he finds depraved <laughs> and ugly. I actually, it's always painful. Um, uh, he also can't stand those institutions further north, right, because they spend too much time talking about what? Theology, right? So none of that. He wants enlightenment empiricists. Enlightenment empiricists or classical rhetoricians from Europe. Okay, so that's who he's bringing. So George Bladerman, his, the first uh, occupant of this building, is a uh, modern languages professor from Berlin. Uh, and we've long told the story that, of course, this is George Bladerman's residence, and the upstairs is where you know he has his accommodations, uh, and then downstairs is the classroom space. Clean story. Students are enlightened, and democracy thrives. Uh, okay. But now we can actually take the architectural evidence and put it in conversation with the actual historical documents. If we're purporting to be historians and we're telling a historical story about the University of Virginia, we might want to look at some documents. Okay, so here we see George Bladerman. Oh, here we are. George Bladerman, you see him down here. And you can see that this is the 1830 census. Some of you will have noticed that there's a little kerfuffle in the news around a question on that 2020 census. Yeah, that's the federal decennial census. This is also the federal decennial census. It happens every 10 years. This is the 1830 federal decennial census. And so if we look at this census, you can see uh, this is males by age. So this is whom? That's, that's Professor Bladerman. Let's flip down here. This is between 5 and 10. And this is between 10 and 15, I think. Who are these? Bladerman's three lusty boys. We flip over to this side, and who's this? His wife. Super convenient, right? Husband, wife, three lusty boys living in a nice house uh, in, Al in Albemarle County. Except that when you walk down the academical village and you're walking on those sidewalks, you almost uh, never see these little guys, right? I'm walking down the sidewalk and see them there, there they are. What on earth are those little triangular boxes? Air and light for something, right? Air and light for something. Well, when we actually continue, when we flip that 1830 census over, it turns out, now I want you to do some math with me. Five plus three is what? Plus three? Plus four? Plus three? Plus the five from the previous side equals 23. So when the federal decennial census taker knocks on the door of Pavilion 4, he records not five people, but 23. A white family of five and an enslaved population of 18. Whoa. We hadn't noticed. So I told you a lie. I told you that the pavilions were two stories. And you believed me because Jefferson wanted you to believe me. When you're up on the lawn, all you can see are the fronts of the pavilions because Jefferson builds the academical village on a ridge line. And by building it on a ridge line, he actually builds three-story buildings on either side of that ridge. 
He carves off the top of the ridge, moves that, he doesn't do that, teams of enslaved men do that, move the soil to either side so that your appearance on the lawn side, the view that Jefferson wants you to see, is of a two-story building. But it turns out they're all three-story buildings, and those uh, uh, cellar spaces, that, that um, subterranean, partially subterranean floor is actually holding up all that earth to create the flat lawn. He's a design genius. But what it also does is it means that when we take this digital cross-section of uh, one of those pavilions, they're all three stories. And there's a whole floor down below that would be the residence of those 18 people. One cellar space, residence for 18 people, whose physical presence is never acknowledged in the landscape of the, the story of education, the story of democracy. They're buried hidden, out of sight, not accidentally. It's a design strategy, right? Why? Why is it a design strategy? Because Jefferson fully acknowledges in his writing the hypocrisy of slavery in the making of democracy, right? It's what he refers to as having the wolf by the ears, something that will bite you and might kill you, but you have a tenuous control of it at the moment, right? He's painfully aware of that. So he designs an academical village, an academical institution intended to buttress democracy in a way that intentionally hides the institution that undermines the integrity of the democracy he's building. So we can map this, and we've done this. Uh, you can take that distribution. Right up here is Professor Bladerman and his family, right? And so we've mapped 1830, 1840, 1850, and 1860. Uh, and we've come up, there's, a, there's an average of about 150 enslaved people fully in residence at the Academical Village at the University of Virginia in any one point in time. An entire community of folks whose story had never been told and whose presence was always just maybe distantly assumed, but never in any way documented. So we've done that work. George Bladerman turns out uh, to be one of the few people who actually has one of his uh, owned people, Lucy Cottrell, survives in a photograph. We now estimate thousands of enslaved people were at the University of Virginia. We have two photographs. We have 500 names and two photographs. The dignity of that humanity erased, erased. So, and why does Lucy Cottrell survive in a photograph? because she's holding Charlotte Bladerman, one of those lusty boys' first children, right? She only survives as an object cradling the preferred grandchild. And so when we talk now about this, no, no, not that yet, about this cellar space, right? Lucy Cottrell's the cook. She has an incredible responsibility to deliver three meals a day with that whole vast landscape of the yards, the pastures, the gardens, Right? All of these people are actually subservient to her as an enslaved woman. She's actually responsible for ensuring a whole series of processes for the delivery of a meal at the table. Right? And so her biography now, her story, is starting to surface as we ask all kinds of questions. Nobody ever intended her to be documented. Right? And so it's very hard to find that reference, which means we have to uh, look in extraneous documentation, other, other references to try to find as much as we can about what her life might have been like, right? So corollaries, peer, peer experiences are part of that, uh, part of that critical story. Um, we also know, however, that George Bladerman was dismissed from the university after only five years of service. He was dismissed from the university for publicly beating his wife twice. <coughs> which raises all kinds of questions for us. If he's publicly beating his wife, what must Lucy Cottrell's experience have been? <coughs> Reminding us that the 18th and the 19th century American South, as is true for so many other places, is a landscape of sexual violence, a whole other narrative untold, but very real as a part of the story, and one that my institution and many institutions have got to start acknowledging. 
So when you go to the University of Virginia, those of you that have been, particularly if you're there in April or May, you love the gardens. We have these spectacular gardens that spill out behind the pavilions, filled with azaleas and tulips, dogwood trees, spectacular Virginia Springs, although I will say I'm a little intimidated by the spectacle of the, you know, <laughs> y'all got some gardens. Um, <laughs> these are all made up. These spectacular gardens, um, they were all installed in 1948 to 1952 by the ladies of the Garden Club of Virginia, right? And so those of us that have fallen in love with these gardens as part of this academical village landscape have got to historicize that and to recognize that that's actually now an historic part of the landscape, but a reflection of the agency of white women in the mid 20th century and not a reality of the Jefferson era experience, right? What was there, right? And so we can actually look at these early maps and you look at these gardens behind the pavilions, they're littered with little buildings. There's all kinds of little buildings out there. And for those of us that actually know something about the antebellum landscape, I know that those are summer kitchens and smoking houses and butchering pans for hogs, kitchen coops, plucking chickens, all those things that are essential for the delivery of a meal to the table, all of that's happening in these garden spaces. Those garden spaces are the spaces of everyday life for those 150 people. What's interesting also is that these curvilinear walls, UV is famous for these curvilinear walls, um, all of those walls we've now determined were all rebuilt in 1948 as a part of this garden restoration work. They were all rebuilt at four feet. When they were Jefferson's walls, they were eight feet tall. Why? Visibility, right? The visibility, seeing the institution of slavery is something that Jefferson's strategically trying to avoid. In the midst of a landscape of slavery, it seems kind of silly, right? Slavery is everywhere. How do you hide slavery? Nonetheless, Jefferson is such an idealist that he's seeking to do this at every turn. So we've been building this digital model. Um, the ladies of the Garden Club of Virginia are not interested in my coming out and tearing out all of their gardens um, and doing archaeology, you know, square, square meter by square meter, although I'd love to do that. So we've been building this digital model that allows us to reimagine and reconstitute how did the academic village actually function, which is raising interesting questions for us about sight lines and surveillance, modeling and visibility, right? What, because Jefferson cares so much about seeing. What is seeing? Because he sees, he imagines seeing to be formative, and that's a different talk, right? But he has a sort of theory around seeing being formative. If seeing is formative, then seeing that which is depravity, uh, corrupt, corrupt is probably the better word. Seeing with that which is corrupt will corrupt the person, therefore, Blinding is the strategy, uh, a strategic response. So this digital model has been incredibly helpful to us. Uh, so we're able to use archaeological, so this is a, a massive team project, archaeologists together with historians, intellectual historians, social historians, historians of slavery, um, all working together, testing each other. Well, we think that this, the archaeology says this. Well, what do uh, typical buildings in the landscape that survive say, right? And so it's a robust conversation, but it means that we're re able to reinstall fenceways. Uh, and understand how the daily operations of this particular landscape. And this is still a project. This is under production. Um, uh, you can see it on the website at the University of Virginia, which I can uh, share the link with you if you want to play with it. Uh, but it's really the uh, technologists that are behind this are super geeky. It's actually accurate to the inch. <laughs> Leave it to UVA, of course, to make it accurate to the inch. That's not necessary, but good enough, right? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so they, they give talks at different conferences about this same model with very, very different content. Um, okay, <laughs> so, um, so Wells, all the archeological evidence, right? What, what, what is the operation of this landscape like? And I'm showing you this particular image because this kitchen, which no longer survives, uh, was the kitchen that was operated by the, pers the second person for whom we have a photograph. Her name is Isabella Gibbons, and you see her here in the top left. She was the uh, cook in this particular kitchen. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to return to that at the end of our talk today. One of the buildings that was uh, built at the University of Virginia that was under construction when Jefferson died was an anatomical theater. Uh, training in medicine was essential for any modern university. Jefferson presumed that there would be a medical professor. In fact, there was a series of both uh, uh, medical theory uh, faculty as well as medical practice faculty uh, in the first couple decades. Uh, a fundamental um, training opportunity in medicine, of course, is anatomy. You have to have, it's kind of like basic math, right, for advanced math, you have to have anatomy. 
And uh, one of the fundamental operations for anatomy, of course, is what? Yeah, cadaver dissection. And because Jefferson believes in the practice, right, he, he, not just uh, book learning, but also practice, that means that every, uh, in many other uh, medical institutions, the professor demonstrates a full body cadaver dissection. At UVA, the students themselves undertake a full body cadaver dissection. What's the difference? Numbers. More bodies. More bodies. Where is UVA getting all of these bodies? Right? The long standing narrative had been, well, felons, of course. Right? In the 19th century, if you're a felon, you give your body over to science after you're executed. Easy. Clean. Morally unburdened. Turns out that's not true. Right? Turns out that the University of Virginia, oh, oh, sorry. Got a few more. So there's the anatomical theater, uh, which was added right, uh, at the, right at Jefferson's death. Uh, here's another view. And this is a digital interior. And I'm showing all of these because my son actually did this particular model. Um, <laughs> so I'm just kind of being a geeky dad at the moment. Um, but this, yeah, so this is a digital model. The building does not survive. Uh, OK, how are, we getting, how are we getting cadavers? Well, the reality is that the University of Virginia is actually a participant in an illegal trade in cadavers with communities of people in Richmond, which is our major uh, capital uh, and the largest concentration of enslaved and black people in the state of Virginia at this point, uh, people who called, are called resurrectionists. The, and the job of those resurrectionists literally are to exhume a recently deceased uh, person uh, and deliver that body within 48 hours of death, right? Because rigor mortis starts to set in and the uh, uh, decay has a profound impact on the usability of the cadaver by the student or the faculty member. And so this is a timely process. Um, we, about uh, four years ago, came across a cache of letters, a cache of letters written by uh, Professor Davis. They had been in our special collections there the entire time. Nobody bothered to read them. Uh, and he, in fact, is engaged in this illegal transfer of cadavers from Richmond. The bodies are being exhumed in Richmond, being put in barrels. Those barrels are then being put on the train. They're being delivered to Charlottesville train station. Uh, and then soon thereafter, an enslaved man named Anatomical Lewis, his job is to go to the train station, uh, unpack the barrels, and prepare the bodies for cadaver uh, dissection. And then after dissection, to actually uh, boil down the remains to deliver the study skeleton to the student at their graduation. Uh, so it's a pretty horrific process. So why African-Americans? Why were so many of the cadavers dissected by the University of Virginia African-Americans? Political convenience is the obvious answer. Who's going to resist? But there's another answer also. And that gets to the fact that the University of Virginia has, through the 19th century, an unfolding sequence of uh, research studies and faculty members who are engaged in research desperately trying to understand the origins of racial difference. Studies that would, by the middle of the 19th century, be re-pivoted or pivoted by a guy named Charles Darwin to conversations around species. Right? But some of the most fundamental research in scientific analysis of racial difference is happening both at Harvard and at the University of Virginia. And Jefferson himself, when he's in Paris, is actually inaugurating this question. He's engaged with a bunch of other intellectual elites, other empiricist enlightenment thinkers, um, who are interested in species studies, race studies, in Europe, in Paris, specifically. Uh, well, he, when he's writing in the, uh, 1785 to 89, he's drafting and finishing his notes on the state of Virginia. Uh, so he's involved in this question around racial difference. That question persists as a driving question in medical research at the University of Virginia for the next 100 years. And so there's a series of faculty. And here we have uh, uh, Cabell, uh, James Lawrence Cabell, uh, publishes this volume called The Testimony of Modern Science and the Unity of Mankind, which uh, uh, historians, of, uh, intellectual, uh, sort of sci historians of science would have suggested would have been a major publication had Darwin not stolen all of his thunder. Uh, with, um, uh, thank you, <laughs> that other book. <laughs> um, so Testimony of Modern Science and Unity of Mankind 
one of the fundamental convictions that's here is that uh, Cabell is committed to monogenesis. Define. A single origin of all people. Because he's an evangelical. Right? Right? And so he, in which, if you haven't noticed, Jefferson's not. Right? <laughs> Jefferson's completely comfortable with polygenesis. Cabell is an evangelical, and UVA by this point is robustly evangelical, is raising all kinds of questions around monogenesis and the problem of monogenesis relative to the multiplicity of, of races. It's an intellectual problem. It's a scientific problem. And uh, the contribution that Cabell makes is this commitment to permanent varieties. You see this phrase right here. Permanent varieties. A single species, all the same origin, but as plants will take on different colors depending on the soil in which they're planted or the uh, uh, conditions in which they're flourishing, so too, after a long period of time, human beings do the same thing. So biologically observable difference in race is a result of climactic conditions. Those permanent varieties from a single species, however, they are acquired particular, they're here, this is the critical word. They are permanent, right? Because species have, been, have occupied different climactic contexts for so long, for so many centuries, those uh, differences are now permanent, which means that they become essential. Right? And this is this shift in intellectual theory, intellectual medical theory, towards essentialization of race. That race has a central characteristic that's not just physical and biological, but is also, ladies and gentlemen, intellectual and moral. Moral character is an essential quality of race. Intellectual capacity becomes an essential quality of race. Slavery shapes not just the operations of our landscape, but the very curriculum and the framework by which we're graduating students. This essential character would then be picked up by this man, Paul Berenger, and this is an absolutely horrific uh, quote, and I'm sorry to, I'm just going to read a small segment of it, but um, at the moment, so of course this is after emancipation, this was the rise of, uh, just at the moment of the political rise of the new Negro, right, and so we're beginning to see uh, that uh, early 20th century moment of black agency. Um, uh, Paul Berenger picks up on Cabell's assumptions about permanence, and you'll see this one sentence, the second half here. I will show that the ages of degradation under which he was formed, meaning the savagery of Africa, and the 50 centuries of historically recorded savagery with which he came to us, cannot be permanently influenced by one or two centuries of enforced correction. Ladies and gentlemen, what are those one or two centuries of enforced correction? The institution of slavery, which he actually sees as a civilizing process, right? But he sees that as a civilizing process um, a failed civilizing project. Why is it a failed civilizing project? Cabell? Because race is essential, right? We can do our very best to civilize African Americans, but they are unchangeable because race has essential characteristics. It's immutable, right? Raising for us all kinds of questions in our present moment, right? about the criminalization of the black body. This, of course, leads to all kinds of social structures in Virginia, and I have for you just one of them. Uh, this is the Racial Integrity Act, which was passed by the Virginia State Legislature in 1924. The Racial Integrity Act um, uh, funded a registrar in every county to specifically identify the race, the identified race of every person in that county as if you were registering voters. And if you were uh, questionably white, you had to get your birth records to demonstrate that you were white. The threat here is the mixed race person. Because the challenge is not so much to identify vari variability of race, that's not the challenge. The challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is to move all, if, this is what uh, eventually comes, uh, comes from what historians refer to as the one drop rule. Right? Having a single drop of African blood in one's body makes you black. Right? That's coming from this series of, uh, of acts that pass, that pass all across America. 
Indiana actually has the very first one. Right? And so these kinds of acts create two conditions, whiteness and non-whiteness, which is one of the reasons that in the state of Virginia, our indigenous American communities have had such a difficult time establishing federal, um, federal recognition because they don't have the genealogical record. The state affirmed record doesn't exist because indigenous Americans are black, right? Mixed race people are all just black. It's the creation of whiteness and blackness. And that established clear line of whiteness does what? This is where we get white supremacy, right? This is the intellectual and policy foundation for the flourishing of white supremacy that's not just a handful of crazies. Everybody that's white in Virginia, almost everybody, is drinking this water. This is a uniform condition in the early 20th century Virginia landscape. Let's see how it plays out. This is the Paramount Theater. Charlottesville's very, very proud of the Paramount Theater downtown. Those of you who've been to Charlottesville, have you seen a show here? Yeah? It's amazing. It's an incredible theater. 1930s, pinnacle of the sort of, you know, the, the great age of movies. Um, today, when we go to the newly restored Paramount Theater, we all go through that grand entrance underneath the blade. You can see where I'm going, right? That's not true for all people in Virginia, right? So all white people would go under that entrance, and all non-white people will go into this entrance, right? So there's the ticket office, you go through that door, that door leads directly to a staircase, that staircase leads to a gallery. This is a photograph of the interior of the Paramount Theater from the 1950s, reminding us that segregation was very much a, a, a reality well through the 20th century. Why is segregation so important? Because of the essential qualities of moral and intellectual depravity, right? What's assumed to be the faulty moral character of African Americans, it might be contagious. It's essential to keep the races apart. So segregation is not just because white people don't like black people, it's because white people are presuming that black people will actually corrupt Anglo-Saxon white purity. Right? It's not just, it is about hate, but it's not just about racial hate. It has a policy foundation. It has an intellectual history. It has research. Medical research affirms the importance of segregation. And that segregation happens not just in buildings, but in whole landscapes. This is one of Charlottesville's most robust mid -20th, early and mid 20th century African American neighborhoods called Vinegar Hill. Vinegar Hill had 600 families, 30 businesses, and a church. One year after the federal courts required Charlottesville to integrate its public schools, one year after that enactment, the city of Charlottesville engaged in urban renewal. Now, we took a public vote, but keep in mind that this is prior to the Voting Rights Act. What's in place in Virginia and in so many other places across the American, well, across the country, prior to the Voting Rights Act of 19, 1965? Poll tax, and what is a poll tax? It means that you have to actually buy your vote. You have to pay for the infrastructure of voting, right? But what most people don't realize about poll taxes is that they're cumulative. So if you want to pay this year's poll tax and you didn't pay last year's poll tax, you have to pay last year's poll tax too. You have to catch up, right? They compound, which means after two to three years, no African American in the city of Charlottesville can possibly pay the poll tax because it's been in place for 40 years, which means they can't vote which means they can't defend their neighborhood. And so White Charlottesville simply cleared this entire neighborhood. 30 businesses as well, hold, hold that thought. And when I tell the story in Charlottesville, lots of people now know the story of Vinegar Hill, but what they don't recognize is that this is a serial process. This was Canada, and that's Gospel Hill, the University of Virginia, the bottom end of the University of Virginia is right here. There's the lawn. 
as we expanded our research infrastructure and our necessity to house students, we also, as an institution, cleared two African-American neighborhoods, Canada and Gospel Hill. One for um, uh, the expansion of the liberal arts facility, and the second for the clearing out of our hospital. What is today, Gospel, what was then Gospel Hill, is today our new fancy 1980s hospital wing. We built this in the 1980s, having just purchased and cleared the entirety of a African-American neighborhood. Now, we did so legally. We bought all the land, right? But it raises all kinds of ethical questions about what is a public university for? What, in fact, is the mission and the commitment of a public institution? These are questions that we have to ask. And so these are, these are three truths that I haven't had time to fully unpack today, but that it's important for us as an institution to ask about the legacy of past decisions on present communities. And it's not at all a surprise that Charlottesville, as is true across the country, the average black family in Charlottesville has one-tenth the wealth of their white counterparts. This is a national statistic. What's wealth? Why is, why is wealth not income? Assets. 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 Like? Houses and? Businesses. businesses. Right? Houses and businesses are mechanisms for building wealth. One-tenth, ladies and gentlemen, and this has remained unchanged since the 1960s passage of the Civil Rights Acts. This condition is unchanged. That policy, those policy moves of the 60s, haven't done anything. And these have, and I was so grateful to be in that panel. I'm so, sorry I had to leave earlier, but I really wanted to hear the panel just prior to my talk because we have to also think about the psychological impacts. What does it mean for the disentanglement and di uh, um, dislocation of an entire neighborhood? Mindy Fullalove uh, has done some really phenomenal research on the social um, and psychological impacts of urban renewal on African American families, right? The damage is deep. The psychological wounds are painful. And they shape black choices today. At our medical center, we have an emerging body of research that's true with many, many other medical centers, that health, an individual's health, is at least 40, and actually I just gave this very talk to the medical center, uh, and they corrected me. They said that the social determinants of health are not just 40, but maybe as much as 70%. So your health and well-being is not just decided by the food you eat. Well, it is in part decided by that, and that has an economic condition as well, right? But one's economic condition, where you live, and your access to resources, plays at least 50% role in your well-being and your longevity as a human being. Death rates, infant mortality rates, you pick the benchmark. African Americans in, in the United States today are in almost all of those categories the lowest performers. Why? Because of the psychological legacy and the stealing of wealth. Theft and hurt and harm. Much of this work in Charlottesville was certainly cat catalyzed by the fact that our grounds, what we call the University of Virginia, was invaded by white nationalists two summers ago, almost three summers ago. And so I'm using the words of the mother of the woman who was killed that next day to say she's grateful, in fact. She's grateful that we're having this conversation, the price was high. But she's grateful that we're having this conversation in Charlottesville today. But it's not a conversation that everybody's ready to have. Because it's a history that we have not wanted to unpack. Because it raises profound questions about our legacies. And I'm gonna conclude with one act that the university has inaugurated over the last two years. <clears throat> The University of Virginia uh, president, Terry Sullivan, the previous president, commissioned the President's Commission on Slavery. 
And the very first re uh, recommendation from that commission was build a memorial. Build a memorial to the enslaved people that honors their dignity, that elevates their humanity, that tells the truth, and that names the names. And so that's what we've done. And this is the uh, artist re uh, architecture reconstruction of the memorial. It has a rich sequence of symbolic references. Those symbolic references are all derived from the local community. The university made almost no design decisions. The design team made many decisions, but they're all directly informed by conversations in basements and in parish halls throughout Charlottesville. The legacy community, the descendant community of the University of Virginia told our design team what they wanted. This is their memorial because it tells their story. Don't talk about me without me. So the inside wall will include five, sorry, 4,000 gashes, 4,000 horizontal gash marks for what we now estimate to be the, about 4,000 people who at some point had their labor stolen through the condition of slavery at the University of Virginia. 500 names will be above 500 of those 4,000 gashes, but the absence of names is a powerful reminder of the active erasure of a destructive history. There's a water table here that'll have the a timetable of the history of slavery in the state of Virginia from 18, sorry, 1619, which we actually picked before the 1619 project came out of the New, uh, New York Times. I'm really kind of thrilled about that. Um, 1619, all the way through the death of Isabella Gibbons. Because her story is one we can trace. She left the University of Virginia in 1865 at the moment of emancipation, and she dedicated the rest of her life to being an educator in the black school in Charlottesville. Educating not just children, as we might imagine, but in fact, the whole of the black community. Why was Isabella Gibbons so properly prepared to be the lead educator in the black school at the moment of emancipation, ladies and gentlemen? Because she'd been enslaved at the University of Virginia. She taught herself to read and write. She overheard lectures. She read books in the library. She had a vision of hope for a post-slavery future. And then she gave the rest of her life to realizing that dream. She is without question one of Charlottesville's most important educators in the history of the last 200 years. And our memorial ends with this quote written by her in 1867. Can we forget the crack of the whip, the cowhide, the whipping post, the auction clock, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten that by those horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not, nor ever will. It's really important that the University of Virginia put this as the final thing that you read when you go to the memorial. Why? Not because we forgot but because we chose to ignore. The University of Virginia's complicit support and encouragement of the institution of slavery is a story we are beginning to tell. Our work in eugenics, our support for school closures, the legacy of the theft of wealth building mechanisms by the institution, those are conversations we're just now starting to have recognizing that the problem of race in America is not one just of slavery, but one of the legacy of racial oppression and theft of dignity and identity and wealth and community. And what is the responsibility of a public university to respond to that condition that they generated? And in closing, I would ask you from many different institutions Ask the hard questions of your institution. What is the legacy that your institution has rent in those local communities? And what does repair look like? Powerful institutions harm. 
They just do. Our opportunity, especially for those of you who identify as Christians, our opportunity is to enact the work of repair.